Before we start today's video, I want to bring to you a quick word from our sponsor. Over the years, we've covered a lot of real-life cases that have been solved. I'm sure some of you have been thinking, I would like to solve a case. Well, now you can. Hunt a Killer is an immersive murder mystery subscription box that is told over the course of six episodes, or six boxes. If you subscribe, they send you a new box each month filled with different clues and physical items that you can use to solve the crime. This includes piles of documents, evidence, audio recordings, and case files. I have tried it out for myself, and I've been having so much fun with my family just trying to figure it all out. It feels like a real-life case, and it's just unbelievable how engaged I was and what a unique experience it is. If you get stuck, there's also a Hunt a Killer community where you can talk about the case and try to solve the puzzles together, and just talk about true crime. Subscriptions start as low as $25 per month, but Hunt a Killer is not just a subscription company. If you're looking for an all-in-one experience, then they definitely have that in their store as well. Right now, you can go to huntakiller.com forward slash criminal and use code criminal to get $10 off your purchase. I think it is a perfect Christmas gift for anyone who is interested in true crime. I guess the real question is, do you have what it takes to hunt a killer? Nine-year-old Candace Rogers lived in Spokane, Washington in 1959. Her friends and family called her Candy. Candy was a member of the Campfire Girls, a youth group focused on outdoor activities. On March 6, 1959, she came home from school, played with her dog, ate a cookie, and then set out to sell campfire mints in her neighborhood. When Candy did not return by nightfall, her grandfather, mother, friends, and neighbors started to look for her. Over the next few days, thousands of people started searching for her. This included Marines, airmen, and military aircraft. Sadly, an Air Force helicopter involved in the search crashed and the three crew members passed away. On March 21, 1959, 15 days after Candy was last seen, two off-duty airmen hunting in the woods about seven miles from her home noticed a pair of children's shoes. The two men informed the police about their finding. The next morning, when that area was searched, Candy's body was found. She had been indecently assaulted and strangled with a piece of her own clothing. It was a crime that rocked Spokane. Hundreds of tips came in, but investigators were unable to identify the person that took Candy's life. All they had was DNA of the suspect found at the crime scene. Sergeant Zach Stormont of the Spokane Police Department described the case in the following way. I keep saying it's the Mount Everest of our cold cases, the one that we could never seem to overcome, but at the same time, nobody ever forgot. Recently, with advances in DNA technology, investigators were able to create a DNA profile from the evidence found at the crime scene back in 1959. They then made use of genetic genealogy and found a relative of the suspect. Investigators then interviewed the relative and took their DNA sample. Finally, in 2021, investigators revealed that they believe John Ray Hoff is the man who took Cindy's life. John grew up in Spokane and had a record of petty juvenile crime. When he was 17, he joined the army and served in Korea. In 1959, when Candy's life was taken, he was 20 years old and lived about a mile from her home. In 1961, he was convicted of grabbing a woman and tying her up before strangling her. The woman survived and John served six months in jail. As a result of the conviction, he was discharged from the army. John then sold cutlery and worked in a lumberyard. He also married and had children. In 1970, at the age of 31, he took his own life. To make sure that John is responsible for the crime, investigators exhumed his remains. He was buried in the same cemetery as Candy. After some more DNA testing, it was confirmed that John is responsible in November of 2021. Investigators are not sure if John knew Candy, but they did find one connection. John's stepsister was also a campfire girl who served as Candy's big sister in the program. While the identification brought some relief to Candy's surviving relatives, it was agonizing for Sergeant Storman to have to tell John's widow and four children that he is responsible for such a heinous crime. John's daughter Kathy, whose DNA was used to link her father to the crime, said that she felt disbelief, anger, and sadness to learn that her father had been identified as the suspect. She was nine when he took his own life. It's just really sad to find out that someone not even just your dad, but just someone in your family could do something like that. I'm very, very sorry for what my dad did, that he took her life, 
horribly. I hope that it gives her peace knowing that, even though it's not really justice because he doesn't get any punishment, but that his name has that on it now, and they can know it's solved. Thirty-two-year-old Janet Love lived in Bedford, Texas in 1986. She grew up in a big family in Louisiana, but made her way to Texas when she found work as a ticket agent for Delta Airlines. On April 23, 1986, Janet was working the 3 p.m. to midnight shift at the Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport. Thereafter, she went home to her apartment in Bedford. The next day, on April 24, she did not show up for work. Two of her co-workers who were concerned made their way inside of her apartment to check up on her. Inside of her apartment, they found Janet's body. She had been indecently assaulted and shot. Investigators collected DNA evidence from her body that belonged to the suspect. They also interviewed a lot of people, but did not gather any useful leads. Recently, the DNA was used to create a DNA profile. It was then submitted to the combined DNA index system, but no matches could be made. Investigators then decided to send the DNA to the University of North Texas in Denton County, where the school's Center for Human Identification made use of genetic genealogy to identify the suspect. Finally, in September of 2021, they identified him as Ray Anthony Chapa. They also linked him to various other crimes. Investigators learned that he lived in a neighboring apartment complex less than a thousand feet away from Janet. But as far as they could tell, Ray and Janet did not know each other before he took her life. Investigators are unable to arrest him as he passed away in January of 2021 from a terminal illness, but they are 100% sure that he would have been convicted if still alive. Janet's younger sister Rebecca Roberts had this to say, It's probably best that he is not alive and that our family doesn't have to go through a trial and all of the roller coaster of emotions that would come with that. None of it's going to bring her back but it is some sense of justice. Please say that Ray also lived in Montana and Chicago. It is very possible that he is involved in even more crimes. If you have any additional information, please call the Bedford Police Department at this number. Sixty-eight-year-old Robert Wong lived in Memphis, Tennessee in 2017. He was a retired military man, having worked as an Air National Guardsman. He had been diagnosed with cancer and was receiving treatment. On November 23, 2017, Robert was looking forward to spending Thanksgiving Day with his family, but he wasn't feeling well. His family then went out to an Asian restaurant for their Thanksgiving meal while he stayed at home. When his family returned home, they saw that his blue Honda Odyssey minivan was gone, which was odd because his illness stopped him from driving. His family then found Robert's body on the ground. He had been fatally shot. Because of his stolen vehicle, investigators believe that it was a robbery that went wrong. The vehicle was found the next day a few miles from his home, but there were no clues leading to a suspect. The case went cold until recently. New evidence and witness interviews led detectives to 19-year-old Dallas Perkins. He is currently serving a non-related seven-year prison sentence for aggravated robbery. Dallas was just 15 years old when he took Robert's life. In November of 2021, he was arrested and charged in connection to the case. He is charged as a juvenile and is now awaiting trial.